things, perhaps, perhaps nothing is as sweet as children. Amen? Amen. Jonah chapter 2, we're going to be reading all of chapter 2, verses 1 through 10 this morning. If you'd please turn there and then stand if you're able for the reading of God's holy word. Jonah chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. Hear the word of the Lord. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord, his God, from the belly of the fish, saying, I called out to the Lord out of my distress, and he answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol I cried, and you heard my voice. For you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the floods surrounded me. All your waves and your billows passed over me. Then I said, I am driven away from your sight, yet I shall again look upon your holy temple. The waters closed in over me to take my life, the deep surrounded me. Weeds were wrapped about my head at the roots of the mountains. I went down to the land whose bars closed upon me forever. Yet you brought up my life from the pit, O Lord my God. When my life was fainting away, I remembered the Lord and my prayer came to you into your holy temple Those who pay regard to vain idols forsake their hope of steadfast love. But with the voice of thanksgiving, I with the voice of thanksgiving will sacrifice to you what I have vowed I will pay. Salvation belongs to the Lord. And the Lord spoke to the fish and it vomited Jonah out upon the dry land. As the word of the Lord, beloved, it is without error. It cannot fail us because it is all that we need. Let's pray. Father, as we talk this morning, God, about prayer, we just thank you immediately right now. God, we just thank you that we can pray. That, that Lord, like Jonah said, we can know that you hear us. Thank you for hearing us. Lord, would you give us grace now to hear you. God, help us to be on the other side of this conversation with you, Lord, and to actually hear you. Let us not be distracted. Lord, whatever whatever troubles are going on throughout the week, Lord, Lord, help us to lay them down at the foot of your cross right now. Feed us your word. Speak to us. Speak to our hearts in our minds. God, we need you. We need the voice of the Lord. Help us now. God, help me to only say what your voice is saying and nothing more. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Let me tell you about the first time I ever prayed. First time I ever prayed, I was in the sixth grade, and I didn't pray to God. I prayed to my grandmother. I prayed to my grandmother. My grandmother had been living with us for several years. She had suffered with lung cancer and emphysema. And then she had just recently passed away just a few weeks before then. And I was, it was just a restless night. It was probably 1, 2 in the morning, and I couldn't sleep, and I was missing her. And I just wanted to talk to her. And I'd seen people pray, not in my home, but I'd seen people pray, TV, whatever. So I'd put my hands together. I didn't know how to do it. I probably thought about it a few different ways, you know. I put my hands together and closed my eyes, and I prayed to her. And guess what? She didn't hear me. She didn't hear me. She couldn't hear me. Why? Because she was dead. <laughs> And I, I, listen, I wasn't a Christian. I didn't know God wouldn't save me for several years from then. But I, I didn't realize what the Scriptures say. The Scriptures make it very clear in Hebrews that it is destined for men and women, all people, to die once and then after that to face judgment. I didn't realize that when you die, what happens is you either experience immediately the amazing grace and joy of being in the presence of the Lord, or you face the judgment of the Lord. 
And nothing in Scripture commands us in any way to pray to the dead or for the dead. I didn't realize that. It was one of many sins that God forgave me of. But the point is, I, I didn't realize what prayer was even about. I didn't realize what prayer really was. For me, it was this kind of exercise in futility at the time of just trying to ease and comfort my mind. And, and sadly, I think that's what a lot of people actually think of prayer. I think even a lot of Christians maybe think of prayer in that way. We tend to think of it as some kind of a, a ritual that tries to, that's an attempt to try and soothe our soul, Right? Or many people treat prayer as a kind of just, just speaking into the universe, just hoping to feel some kind of truth, some sort of meditative relaxation exercise. There's other people that actually do think I can pray to anyone and I can pray to anything. I can pray to Mary, I can pray to saints, I can pray to false gods, I can pray to past relatives. And all of that misses what prayer really is. And it misses the power of prayer. William Still was a uh, Presbyterian minister for 50 years. He was known for making very, very long prayers uh, in his services. He would, do, he would pray sometimes for 20 minutes. And get this, apparently when he prayed, kids, young kids would actually take notes on it. I can't imagine that today. Right? But they would take notes as he was praying. And so he had a lot to say on the topic of prayer. Listen to his definition of prayer. Prayer is speaking to God and believing God. Prayer for the Christian is a matter of believing that God is and that he does respond to those who believe in him. We have to believe that God is there and he is listening. You know, you know, last week we talked about miracles, right? We talked about how the book of Jonah is just full of miracles, and we're going to see more of those. And we talked about the reality of miracles. But this morning, let, let's understand another incredible miracle, a common miracle that we actually get to enact whenever we want to by the grace of God. Do you realize you can, whenever you want to, by God's grace, speak to the God of the universe, and He hears you. Let, that, let the weight of that hit you for a moment. Because if your favorite celebrity or your favorite actor came in here this morning and walked up behind you and tapped you on the shoulder and you turned around to see that person, whoever it is, I'm, I'm starting to think of names, but I don't want to say any names. I'm embarrassed y'all. I'm just like, that's his favorite actor? Really? But if that person tapped you on the shoulder and you turned around and they said, hey, I'd like to talk to you, you would probably faint with surprise. But every day, the God of the universe, the maker of all things, the owner of your future, the lover of your soul comes to you and says, hey, come and talk to me. And what do we do? Most of the time, we hardly bat an eye. But most of the time, we kind of yawn at the thought, and we even, we even say, like, oh, God, I'm really tired today. Can we do this tomorrow? We, we treat prayer so frivolously, but it's a miracle that we get to talk to God. This morning, the prophet Jonah has a lot to teach us about prayer and repentance, so let's fish out what we can, pun intended. All right, verse 1. Verse 1, look at verse 1. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God. That should maybe say, finally Jonah prayed to the Lord his God. Because has this guy had some opportunities to pray? Yes. And has he taken a single one of them? No. Look, look back at verse 1, of, of, or I'm sorry, of chapter 1, verse 6. The captain of the boat, a pagan captain, went down to find him sleeping instead of praying and said, would you get up? What do you do when you sleep or get up and pray to your God? Even commanded him to. Did he do it? No. Then Jonah goes back up on the deck of the ship. What does he find? He finds a bunch of pagan sailors doing what he ought to be doing. They're in a circle, having a prayer circle, praying to all their gods, and he should have joined them praying to his, but no, he didn't. All this talk of prayer, and it's not until Jonah is drowning, literally, 
Actually, it's not even then that he prays. Not even drowning makes him pray. What does he have to do? What has to happen for him to pray? God has to actually send a miraculous fish to swallow him, and then he prays. Now, I know none of you have ever done that, right? Not a single one of you has ever waited to the last possible minute to pray. You've never made that mistake in your life. Right? You've never waited and tried everything else, done everything in your own strength, tried everything else, and then finally said, God, maybe I should talk to you. That's never happened to you before, right? I'm sure it has happened to all of us. We're all guilty of that. This is kind of a minor lesson on prayer here at the start, but it's an important one. Three times in the New Testament, the Apostle Paul tells us that prayer should be a constant thing. 1 Thessalonians 5.17 literally says, pray without what? Ceasing. Ephesians 6.18, pray at all times in the Spirit. Romans 12.12, rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. It's almost as if Paul's like, let me hammer this home, right? Pray, 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 pray. Why do we need to be constant in prayer? Why? Well, here's another thing the Apostle Paul says. It's in Him that we live and we move and we have our being. You, you know why you need to be constant in prayer? The same reason that if you want to build muscles, you've got to go to the gym every day. Why? Because if you don't go to the gym every day, what happens? You don't build muscles. If you want to grow, you've got to eat food every day. Why? Because if you don't eat food, what happens? You don't grow. The Christian life is learning how do I walk in the Spirit of God and follow after God? How, how do I learn how to navigate life with God and not just in my own strength? I don't learn how to do that by not praying. I don't learn how to do that by not going to the God who made me, right? Right? We sometimes think of prayer as, as getting brownie points from God. I, th I really think a lot of us do this. We, we, go to, we pray because, you know what, if I pray, I'm going to feel better about myself. I'm going to feel like God appreciates it. No. If you think that way, you're only going to ever come to God when you're having a bad day. Prayer is where you come to get fuel from God for the day. Pr prayer is where you come to get strength from God for what's ahead. Prayer is where you go to God and you give Him gratitude. You lay down thanksgiving to Him. Why? So you can literally train your heart to be thankful for all things and to be needful of Him for all things. Prayer is where we develop the, the muscles of needing God, needing Him. That's where prayer, that's why we need to be constant in prayer. Notice this also in verse 1. Jonah's location, where is he? He's in the belly of the fish. That is not exactly the ideal prayer closet, is it? So I imagine most of you have a prayer closet of some kind, some place you like to pray that smells a little bit better than where Jonah's at right now. Here's the truth, though. We, can, we think so many silly things of prayer. We, we really do. Some of us treat prayer kind of like a magic spell, which, by the way, is probably the most pagan way to think of prayer, right? If I do this, I get this, okay? And, and some of us think that if we use certain things in prayer or gestures that it's more effective. There's people that literally think if I use beads, if I use certain prayer beads or a prayer shawl, if I'm wearing a hat or not wearing a hat, that all of that affects the way that God hears me. We, we think sometimes that if I fold my hands a certain way, if I part my hair a certain way, or whatever, or even that location matters. You know, if I'm sitting in church, God will hear me better than if I'm somewhere else. If I'm facing a certain direction, God will hear me better. I got to get my antenna just right. Some of us think that, you know, prayer is not as effective until I've drank that first cup of coffee in the morning. That one actually might be true. That, that, might, that one might be true. But, but look at Jonah's prayer closet. Look at his circumstance. Look at where he's at. Are you really going to say that Jonah's prayer posture, however cramped in whatever position he's in, 
that it's suspect. Are we saying, are we really going to say that because of where he's at, God's not going to hear him? No, God hears him. Uh, Sam Walter Foss was a poet. He wrote the cutest little poem called The Prayer of Cyrus Brown. I'm going to read this to you, and you're going to get a kick out of this. Are you ready? This is my new favorite poem. The proper way for a man to pray, said Deacon Lemuel Keyes, and the only proper attitude is down upon his knees. No, I should say the way to pray, said Reverend Dr. Wise, is standing straight with outstretched arms and wrapped upturned eyes. Oh, no, 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 said Elder Slow. Such posture is too proud. A man should pray with eyes fast closed and his head contritely bowed. It seems to me his hands should be austerely clasped in front with thumbs pointing toward the ground, said Reverend Dr. Blunt. Last year I fell in Hodgkin's well, head first, said Cyrus Brown, with both my heels a-sticking up, my head a-pointing down. And I made a prayer right then and there, best prayer I ever said, the prayingest prayer I ever prayed, a-standing on my head. Isn't that the cutest thing? That's, you, you know what? There's so much good theology in just such a simple thing. But here's perhaps the worst thing we can do with prayer, the worst way we can approach prayer, is to think that we need to sound a certain way. And as you look at Jonah's prayer, you're probably thinking, this sounds like a psalm. It is a psalm. It's actually a lot of psalms together. Jonah apparently knew the Psalter really well. He includes Psalm 18, 31, 116, a bunch of other pieces of psalms together in a really brilliant, and let's just be honest, it's kind of beautiful. It's a beautiful prayer. But do you ever fear that your prayers need to sound this eloquent and this polished? Do you ever think that way? One of the most common things that I've experienced as a pastor, even as a youth pastor, is people coming to you and say, I know God listens to you more than he listens to me. Now, that's not true. That is not true at all. To think that because I sound a certain way or I stand in a certain place that God hears me more than he hears you. Not true at all. We don't have to be eloquent when we pray. We don't have to be poets. James 5.16 says that, does not say that an eloquent person's prayer has great power. It doesn't say that a gifted speaker has great power. What it says is the prayer of a righteous person has great power. To which someone might say, see, you're righteous and I'm not. No, 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 no. None of us are righteous. The Bible makes that clear. How are we righteous? Y'all tell me. How are we righteous? We are only righteous by having what? The righteousness of Christ. If you belong to the Lord, it's not great righteousness. It's because you have the righteousness of Christ. You are a child of God. And let me ask you this. Parents, parents, the sound of your baby cooing and making little baby gibberish. Or, or the sound of your toddler telling you a story with broken grammar and, and broken words and just all over the place. You don't hate that sound. You don't go, ugh, at that sound. You love that sound. You enjoy that sound. You appreciate that sound. You even begin to learn to understand their language, even as a baby. I, I was so amazed. We had, we had Sarah's family over for a whole week a, a couple of months ago. And we, a little two-year-old Connor is one of my little nephews. I can't understand a word that he's saying. But his mom's like, oh, he's saying this. Like, he, he just speaks their language, you know? God speaks the language of his children. He knows exactly what you're saying. doesn't matter how eloquent or not eloquent you are. In fact, the Lord understands so well how you communicate, you don't even need to speak. Do you realize that? Romans chapter 8, verse 26 through 27. The Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we don't know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit Himself 
intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And what that's saying is this, when you're distraught, when you're struggling, when you're not even sure of what you're feeling, when, when you can't make sense of your thoughts, of your emotions, of, of, uh, you can't even make sense of what you're going through, in those moments, and I'm sure you've been there, have you ever been in that kind of a moment, where you don't know what to say, you can literally just be sitting and just crying to God. And beloved, that's prayer. That's enough. In that moment, the Spirit is interceding for you according to the will of God. God hears that. He understands that. He loves that. We don't need to sound eloquent. Now, that doesn't change the fact that some of us still say, yeah, but I would like to pray better. I would like to, I would like to get a better vocabulary with God. Okay, that, there's nothing wrong with that. How do you do that? Can I make a suggestion? You don't need to go read a book on prayer. You don't need to go read, you know, this poet or this thing. Go pray Scripture. L look at Jonah's prayer. Can you pray that prayer? Have you ever had a day, a week, a month, a year, a lifetime where you could maybe pray that prayer? I'm sure you can. Go pray David's prayer in Psalm 51. Go pray Hannah's prayer in 1 Samuel 2. Go pray Ephesians 1. Go pray Jeremiah 10. Go to all the famous, amazing, incredible prayers in the Bible and glean that language from Scripture. Let Scripture inform how you talk to God. Because guess what? God likes how He sounds. He likes how you sound. He likes how you cry. But God enjoys His own word. Pray His own word back to Him. There's nothing wrong with that. It's, it's just incredible the love of God that we get to experience when you just sit with him in prayer. It's incredible. Now, that's all just verse 1. I know. I know that's a lot. But let's, let's actually jump into Jonah's prayer now. First thing I want you to notice in Jonah's prayer, notice that he gives you a glimpse of how he's feeling. Do you see that? He does not hold back his emotions before God because why would you, right? God knows how we feel. He knows us better than we do. So he doesn't hold back. He's real before God in this prayer. In verse 2 and verses 5 through 6, it says that he calls out to the Lord from the belly of Sheol. Now, Sheol is the Hebrew word for grave. It's the Hebrew word for that place where the souls of the dead would go, right? So in other words, Jonah is saying, I felt like I was dying, right? In fact, the way he describes it is amazing. He describes it as, as going down deep, deep. And the way he describes it makes it clear that Jonah didn't get thrown out of the boat right into the mouth of a fish. He got thrown into the water and he sank and sank as the waves were crashing over him. And apparently he must have been drowning for so many minutes that he felt as if he was getting down to the roots of the mountains. Seaweed was wrapping around him. He was sinking for a while. He was about dead before the fish came and got him. He felt like he was about to die. But look at verse 3. Jonah knows something about this near-death experience. He knows that that experience, it was not a result of God's absence. It was a result of God's presence. But look at what he says. He confesses that who threw him into the deep? God threw me into the deep. It was God's waves and billows that were passing over him. Who did this to me? God, you did this to me. You did this to me. He's being honest about this. He can't blame the sailors. He can't blame the weather. He knows full well who is doing this. This kind of reminds me of Job. It's reminiscent of Job and his wife. Do you remember Job's wife? Oh, what a, what a gem of a woman. Do you remember this lady? Do you remember Job's wife? Job is sitting there covered in soils, or, or soils, boils and sores, Right? He's lost all of his children, he's lost all of his livestock, he's lost all of his houses, he's lost everything. He's sitting there just desperate, scraping his skin with pots. And his wife comes up to him and says, 
why are you still acting with integrity? Just curse God and die. Salt of the earth lady right there. What a, what a precious woman. Makes you wonder, God, why is she the only one left? I don't know that it was a blessing or was it a curse. But look at Job's reply. <laughs> you sound like a foolish woman. That's what he says to her. Shall we accept only good from God and not evil? In other words, Job got it just like Jonah got it. God might use disaster. He might use calamity. He might use what seems evil to bring blessing into our lives. Beloved, God might, God might use sickness, he might use disaster, he might use the loss of a job, he might use the loss of a relationship, he might use the loss of a life to bring you closer to himself. God might do that. In fact, can I, can I just say this? I think God will do that. Can you please look at one person in Scripture that God didn't do that with? He used Abraham's sin to bring him closer to him. He used the murder that Moses committed to bring him closer to him. He uses Israel's sins to bring them closer to him. He uses all the disaster and all of the mistreatment that happens to Joseph to bring him closer to him. Can you think of one person in Scripture that God didn't use disaster and evil to bring them closer to him? Why would we think he'll never do that to me? Yes, he will. He very much so will. Now, I know that's been a repeated lesson. All, all the past three messages in Jonah have had that same lesson in them. There's a reason for that because y'all are stubborn. Me too, all right? And it takes a while for us to get this before it sinks in, pun intended. All right, look at Jonah's fear too. Do you notice Jonah's fear? What is he really afraid of? I, I've been, I'm not that afraid of the water. I, I'm a Florida boy, born and raised. I've been in the water a lot. I've been out in the middle of uh, swimming in the middle of the Gulf of Mexico where you can put a snorkel on and look down and you just see darkness for hundreds of feet below you. All right, and it's creepy. It's creepy. And then you feel something brush your leg. Oh, no. <laughs> okay, that's, that's creepy right there. And you might think when you read Jonah's words that his greatest fear was that, was drowning, the seaweed wrapping around his head. But look at verse 4. I said, I am driven away from your sight. Yet I shall again look upon your holy temple. Now, in Hebrew, there's actually a little question there of what is, what is he trying to say with that temple line? Is he trying to make a declaration like, I will again look upon your holy temple? Or is this like a, a desperate question? It could be either one in the Hebrew. He could be saying, shall I ever again look upon your holy temple? It could be either one. But either way, what's obvious here is that Jonah's real fear, it's not physical pain, is it? It's not drowning. It's not death. What is his real fear? His fear is what? Did I just lose the Lord? Am I separated from the Lord? Now think about that. This man who was trying to get as far away from God as possible has now realized that's a really scary place to be. It's scary to be as far away from God as possible. He's just, his God has just opened up his eyes to realize that. And what's frightening to him is that God might not hear him. God might not be looking at me. God might not let me enjoy his presence any longer. He, he's even wondering, am I, am I going to see the temple again? Am I going to get to sit and worship again? If, if you're an unbeliever here this morning, that might sound strange to you. That might actually sound strange to you. You might be thinking, I don't really see the terror in not being in God's presence. But that's just the thing. Until you have real 
real communion with God, you'll never understand that terror. You never will. Because until you've come to lay hold of God's great and precious promises, until you've come to not, not just give lip service to God, not just appreciate God, but until you've come to love Him, dependently love Him, you don't understand the terror of being banished from Him. You don't understand that terror of being removed from His presence. The best example we have of this is Jesus Himself. Jesus on the way to the cross. He's being tortured in every way, beaten in every way. He gets on the cross. All the pain and suffering he experiences on the cross. What does the scripture say? During all of that, he doesn't say what? He doesn't say a single word during any of that until as he becomes our sin, and he experiences the wrath of God being poured out on him. He experiences the displeasure of God on our behalf. What happens in that moment? What does, what does he do? He cries out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why have you turned your gaze away from me? That's what terrified Christ. Why? Because that's hell. That's hell. Hell is the complete and utter absence of God's love. Now I want to be pointing here. Some, sometimes you'll hear people say, hell is the complete and utter absence of God. That's not true. God's judgment is very present in hell. But there is no love. That's what hell is. And that's why Jonah is so thankful that God just heard him. God answered him, and God pulled him out of the pit. And now, I mean, think about this. Now the fact that he's sitting in a stinky fish belly is proof that God still loves him. Perhaps the reason you're sitting in whatever stinky situation you're in is proof that God what? still loves you. Amen? Finally, verse 8 and 9, we see that Jonah confesses that he's learned his lesson, and he, and he gives a warning to other people. He says, if you give regard to vain idols, vain idols is an interesting phrase there. It, it's two Hebrew words that just mean vain. If you give regard to vain vanities, to worthless, empty nothings. And that's actually a common phrase in Hebrew for idols. If you give regard to vain idols, you're forsaking your hope of steadfast love. J Jonah had put his attention on vain and worthless things, hadn't he? he? He had put his attention, he was trusting in the idol of his own wisdom. He, he was trusting in the hopeless pursuit of making his own destiny. And now he realizes I was in danger when I did that of removing myself from God's covenant chesed, his covenant steadfast love in my life. You know, there's perhaps no sadder thing today than when the church, when believers begin to act like Israel did in the Old Testament, we begin to trust in other things for salvation. But it happens we, obvi we obviously don't see the church today like creating golden calves and bowing down to them. But what the church does to today often is we da bow down and worship at the altar of gimmicks. We bow down and worship at the altar of entertainment. J just this week, I mean literally just this week, I heard about a church who redecorated their entire building. This entire big sprawling building in Star Wars theme. Now you say, oh, that's a cool VBS idea. I mean, you might get sued by Disney, but that's, that's cool. No, it wasn't for VBS. It was, it was to be on theme for the pastor's sermon series, The Gospel According to Star Wars. I, I've, got a good, I've got a good friend who calls that worshiptainment, because that's what it is. It's worshiping of entertainment. 
instead of worshiping God. That's exactly what it is. It's hoping that, that, that through a gimmick, th- through some sort of thing that we put on display, people will be attracted to a building so that when they come in, I, we can just give the most watered-down gospel message as possible. And it's got to be as watered-down as possible. Why? Because you don't break the 11th commandment, thou shalt not offend. You don't want to break that, okay? And so we, we just make it as watered-down as possible. Why? Because then they might listen. And we don't realize God often saves people by offending everything about them. The way God saves us is through a word that says, none of us are good. That that's the salvation message. You're a sinner and you lost and you need Christ. But the gospel that we often hear today is what? You're not that bad. It's okay. And God loves you no matter what you've done, no matter who you are. It says, it says Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. It says he hated Esau. No, he didn't. Well, yes, he did. Beloved, we've we got to recognize that, that salvation belongs. This is what jo- all the while Jonah is saying what? Salvation belongs to the Lord. This is Jonah saying, you know what, God, I was wrong. You can save whoever you want. You can save them whenever you want. And you tell me what to do. You told me, arise and go and deliver my message. And I arise and left because I did not like that message. Beloved, let me ask you something. Do you know that message and do you love that message? And do you honestly believe every lost person in your life, they need that message and that message alone to be saved? Because here's what I've encountered. A lot of us will think, well, you know, if they just change the way they dress, that's a good first step. You know, if they, if they would just come to church once in a while, that would be a good first step. Beloved, people don't need to clean up their life first. People don't need to be told an entertaining message first. They need to be presented the gospel, Period. Because you don't know when God's going to open up someone's eyes. You don't know. First kid I ever presented the gospel to, you know what he was doing? Misbehaving. He believed, by the way. His name was Jose. We're in a little big brothers, big sisters kind of group. And he's just cutting up, misbehaving left and right. And the instructor says, hey, John, can you just take him outside and sit with him? I'm just sitting with him. I don't know what to do. I'm like 17. I have no idea what I'm doing. I'm just sitting next to Jose, and, and Jose is just like, <clears throat> just like complaining, doing, doing that thing that kids do when they get caught. I was like, you okay, buddy? And he just goes, I want to learn about Jesus. Okay. I just told him the gospel, and guess what he does? Demeanor just, I really want to learn about Jesus. You don't know. You don't know. So only bring the gospel message. Verse 10, last verse here. The Lord spoke to the fish. Here's another miracle. And it vomited Jonah out upon dry land. There he is. How do you think Jonah smelled after that? (laughs) Pungent might be putting it lightly. Ripe. You know what Jonah smelled like? He smelled like grace. He smelled like grace. He smelled like somebody that had been brought down to death and delivered by the grace of God. That's what he smelled like. Do you smell like grace this morning? Is that what you smell like? Have you been brought from death to life? Is that what you smell like? You know, after Jonah came another prophet a better prophet, more than a prophet, and that was Jesus. And Jesus wasn't disobedient like Jonah. He he didn't almost die because of his sins. He definitely died because of our sins. For the sins of all those who would believe in him. And Jonah was 
just like Jonah, he was buried in the belly of a fish for three days. Jesus was buried in the grave for three days before he was raised literally from the dead, not just figuratively. And now we too can be raised. You can be raised. You can have that new life. How? You need to admit who you are and who God is. Who's God? He's perfect. He's your maker. He's your creator. He's your sustainer. He's the reason you're alive. He's the reason you're sitting here this morning. Who are we? You're sinners. Me too. The person to your left is a sinner. The person to your right is a sinner. The person behind you is really a sinner. Like you're all sinners. And what I mean by that is, is, is not that, that we're all like not perfect. What I mean is we're all sinful. We're, we're all in our minds, in our thoughts, in our actions, in our words. We're fallen in all of these ways. We're totally depraved in all of these ways. We don't do as we ought to do, as God calls us to do, just like Jonah didn't do. We sin in deed. We sin in thought. We sin in word. And what you need to do is you need to come to Christ because Christ didn't do any of that. And instead, Christ took the punishment for those things. You need to believe and trust in Him that He is a righteous Savior that can save you from your sins. And you need to love Him. You need to love Christ. You need to cherish Him. You need to ask God to give you a desire for Him that says, I want Him and nothing more. Like, Jesus is my portion. What more do I need? That's what we need. And to those of you that are saved, to, to those of you that have a relationship with God this morning, I know it's many of you, let me ask you this. How's your prayer life? How's your prayer life? The answer to that is, it could be, get better. I know, I know that's the answer. But let me put it to you this way. Do you smell like someone who has sat in communion with Christ constantly? You know how you renew your prayer life? You know how you get a better prayer life? Let me tell you. Ready? Step one. You ready? Pray. That's it. That's all you do. There's no magic. Just pray. Pray. You don't need to wait for a fish to swallow you. I hope you don't. All right. I, I hope you don't wait like Jonah and wait for God to give you all of these signs and all of these torments. Instead, I hope my hope for you today, my prayer for you today, is that you would sit with God in prayer and communion until you leave that prayer closet, wherever it is, that prayer position, whatever it is, and you smell like Christ. Let's all smell like Christ. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for Jonah. Thank you for the wisdom of his prayer, the preciousness of it, the honesty of it. Lord, whatever depths we're in, would you hear us, God? Thank you that you hear us. Lord, make us, make us so thankful that you even give us the time of day. We're so nothing before you, and yet you listen to us. So thank you for hearing us. Lord, I pray for anyone in here who, who thinks of the absence of God as something that's not that terrifying. I pray you would terrify them. Lord, I, Lord, I pray that you would, you would give them a sense, a real true sense of just how holy you are. And you would renew in them a desire to really know you, to believe and trust in Christ and not themselves. But Father, make us dependent. God, put us on our knees, put us on our couches, put us in our seats, put our hands together, put them up in the air. Lord, put us in positions of prayer constantly. Make us dependent upon you. Lord, we know that that you want to hear from us, that you desire to hear from us, you desire to answer prayer. Make us faithful to come before you for all things. That's in Jesus' name we ask. Amen.